Hi, and welcome to another Ask GMBN Tech. It's the weekly Q&A session. You get your tech-related mail by questions in uh, in the comments underneath. Don't forget, you can also ask direct questions on here, uh, tech-related, of course, uh, to myself and Anna. Just use, um, just write that in the comments under there. Uh, use that hashtag Ask GMBN Tech so we know which ones are comments and which ones are actually questions. And if they're good enough, we'll feature you on the show. Uh, so let's get cracking with the first one. Uh, can you upgrade a 2013 Fox Float 29 Evolution CTD? Uh, that's the climb trail descend one with a three position to let's say a fit four. Um, do you know what? I'm not sure on a particular model. 2013, that's quite a while back. Now I'm going to say no off the top of my head because the fit four cartridge is newer than that, even though that had a fit CTD cartridge in there. So you've got to bear in mind that on the internals of suspension forks, there's lots of different things that change over the years. That position of the dimple for the air spring, of course, earlier forks didn't even have an air uh, negative spring that had a coil negative spring there. So those would be different as well. And even the threads and the thread pitch on the top of the damper caps are different. So to be honest, you're going to have to double check that. Uh, I don't think it will be the case with that particular fork if you're talking about a modern Fit4 damper, but you might be able to fit one of the earliest ones on there. Um, you're going to have to check with your local Fox suspension specialist. I'm going to put a link. In fact, here's a screen grab on screen. This is going to be for all countries that are listed on the Fox website. I'm going to put a link down there so you can see it. Uh, you're just going to have to ask them yourselves. I'm sorry, but that's quite a specific question about quite a specific fork from 2013. Uh, if it was a case of a 2019 fork up to a 2021 fork, then yeah, you probably could uh, do the internals because most manufacturers allow that within within their ranges, but not something that's that old, I'm afraid. Uh, sorry about that. Next up from Maximilian. Hi there, recently I've been reading an article about different chain loops and why there are different advantages, etc. One thing that caught my attention was there's a method of waxing the chain by immersing it in liquid paraffin wax. A uh, process should have several advantages from efficiency to wear resistance and less dirt. Is it worth doing or something only for roadies? Have you already tested it out? Now, our skinny tie friends on GCN have done this several times and I'm gonna link a video. In fact, there's a little clip of it on screen at the moment whilst I'm talking. Uh, that's John Canning, so he doesn't work there anymore, but he was a proper nerd when it came to tech. Um, and he made a video all about that. So I'm gonna put that link down there because it is a popular video. And all I would say is, Yes, you can get some benefits from it, but do you really want to have to do this on a mountain bike? I think the more important thing on a mountain bike, given the fact that there's loads of friction where we ride, unlike a road bike, there's very minimal amounts of friction. I mean, it's obviously all still there, but there's, a, there's less going on. In a mountain bike, surface conditions, the compound of the rubber on your tire, the pressure you run your tires at, the volume of your tire, uh, the way it carries across the terrain, the suspension on your bike, there's so many different things that factor in it that I really don't think you're gonna get that much of a performance um, increase in terms of efficiency as you would with just using any old chain lubricant on there. You know, obviously you wanna use a wet or a dry lube according to the conditions that you ride in and ceramic based loops will last longer generally on a chain but I'm not convinced that wax in the chain is of benefit unless you specialize in out and out cross-country racing where I guess the what saved could be worthwhile um, has anyone out there waxed the chain let me know should we try it on GMB and tech I'm not convinced we should but I'm totally open to this and I would happily try it if people think it's a worthwhile video to make uh, let us know in those comments underneath uh, next up from Christian Schneider, I recognise your name, you comment quite a lot. Uh, I've put a set of Vittoria Barzos on my bike to make it more suitable for an upcoming cross-country race and I notice they're marked with minimum pressure of two bar, uh, so well, that's like mm, 28 to 30 pounds I think, um, and that's more than what I'd run normally. Do I really put in that much? What pressure does Dolly run in his tyres with roughly the same weight? Uh, yeah, so I'm about 92 and a bit kilos, give or take. Now I'm running the XC race tyres at the moment. Actually, I lie. I was running the XC race tyres, which are Tamils. Uh, right now I'm running the XC trail tyres uh, just because I wanted to try and experiment with the feel. I do prefer the Tamil ones in terms of feel because it's a much thinner, lighter tyre. Now, because of that, I'm running, I reckon, between 27 29 uh, pounds, normally, two pounds less on my front tire, just general rule of thumb there, uh, just because just the way I like to ride on a cross-country bike. So that is under the two bar there, if, if that's what they're saying is the, the actual on those. Now, I don't see this as a problem. Some of the team races have gone down super low, and I've gone as low as 23 PSI in the middle of winter. But bearing in mind that in the middle of winter, you ride different. You ride slower. It's all about trying to get your tire to conform over mud. You don't really push into stuff the same as you do on harder trails. 
Now what I find is um, anything from 27 up to 30 PSI is a pretty good region to be in on that tyre. There's enough support on it so it doesn't roll around too much, it holds its shape well. But also something that people don't really discuss in this is on the super thin cross country tyres you get so much sort of deforming of the casing. They're very supple that you get, it feels like you're running a lower pressure than you actually do. So on the XC Trail ones I'm typically running a pound or two pounds lighter in terms of the pressure I'm running in them because there is a bit more support on the casing. I don't quite like the way they feel but they definitely give you more support and more puncture protection. Uh, I'm definitely a fan of the XC Race. Now if you are concerned about the pressures put in there, you could go a little bit lower and try running inserts in there. So you get a bit more support and protection back, although this kind of does defeat the purpose of going for a lighter tyre. Uh, but I found good success running those very tyres as low as 23 psi and using an insert on the rear. Uh, and that worked for me. Um, all I can say really. Uh, next up, uh, Stuart Dickens, is there anything that a large adjustable spanner, uh, nut strippers, <laughs> can do that a large set of Nipex, sorry, Knipex, flat blade pliers cannot? I'd love to invest in a large flat Knipex. Uh, I want to know it's as applicable as an adjustable spanner, but nicer to use and less nut strippy. Is it? Well, adjustable spanners are great, and sometimes you just need a massive great adjustable spanner, and it's why I spec this workshop with one hanging on the wall over there, because sometimes when removing cassettes, you just need the leverage of a massive spanner. But at home, on my personal toolkit, I've actually abandoned all spanners. Uh, I do keep the little tiny 7, little 8mm just for brake levers sometimes. Uh, and I just run the Knipex stuff because of the fact that they're so good uh, for what they're intended for. Now, if you've already got a great adjustable spanner, there's no need to go out and buy one. You know, you're spending excess on tools, but if you love all your tools and that, then you won't be disappointed. Uh, the size is dependent on what you want. So they do the 250, which um, obviously is good for bigger things, so the jaw opening and the leverage you get, that would be good to use on cassette tools and stuff. But actually, I think it's the 150, um, got a feeling it's the 150 I use most. I'd have to actually check, there's a specific one that I literally use on most things. Uh, it's really helpful. Um, yeah, they're great and you won't round anything off because they're so accurate the way they lock. It's a locking plier is what it is. It's different to an adjustable spanner. Adjustable spanners are brilliant, they are convenient, but they're not quite as accurate as using one of those. So in ideal world, you kind of have both uh, for different uses. Uh, next up from Alan Sandoval. Um, can you make a non-tubeless tyre tubeless? Yeah, you can, uh, despite what the naysayers will say. So when tubeless first came out, it was the UST system first and you had to have specific tyres. So Stans was a company that I don't think they made any products prior. They were like, well, this is no good because you have to go out and buy special rims and adapters and special tyres. It costs loads of money. What about converting the system? So they came out, instead of developing a tubeless valve, you essentially had a rubber rim strip uh, that would both seal up the, the tyre sort of bay there to the rim and obviously it'd have a, a valve on there. And the whole point was that with their solution it would coat the inside of the tyre. You used to put quite a lot more in than you would just on a conventional tyre now uh, to coat it and seal it and also seal the tyre to that rim strip effectively making it like a tubular style tyre. Uh, so yeah if you wanted to do this there is going to be some compatibility issues. You're going to get some tyres that are just such an open weave you literally just it, it's just going to force this way out but most half decent tyres, yeah, you can convert them. You're just going to need quite a lot more sealant to coat the inside of the tyre there uh, and a lot of patience. But that's what it was like when we started using tubeless. Uh, it's not like it now, thankfully. There are a lot of the tyres out there, they're good to go. Uh, next from Justin Locke. In fact, um, I've seen Justin Locke's questions coming up a few times. Uh, I use a cycle specific pressure washer to clean my bike with all the trimmings such as a foam lance. Once I've completed my cleaning regime, what can I do about keeping my bottom bracket lubricated without removing it and my cranks? Well, you don't really need to do much in the way of lubricating in terms of bottom brackets. It's literally just two big bearings in there. So yes, arguably you could be forcing the grease out of those bearings, in which case they're left with nothing in them. So the first thing you should be doing is using a water displacer around there. Uh, something like Bike Protect is a good idea or the equivalent in other brands there. Get that around there. You don't want to start sort of flushing the bearings with it, of course. You just want it in the area to just remove the water. Now from time to time though, you're going to want to make sure that there is sufficient grease in there. So you will need to remove the bottom bracket axle and you can feel the bearings moving by hand. If they feel uh, smooth, but they just feel like they're a bit dry, you can try and eke out a bit more use from them before you replace them by flipping the seals out and putting some grease on them. It doesn't always work though. If they're feeling notchy, it's time for new bearings. Uh, but water will always get in there. It's the bottom part of a bike, water can sit there. Uh, so it's also recommended 
to check the bottom bracket as well. Uh, look on the underside, there's normally a hole for drainage. If yours doesn't have a hole, it might have a cable guide there. If it's got one of those, remove the cable guide and the hole that's there for the cable guide will let any water inside drain out. It's essentially making sure the water can't stay there and the bearings should be pretty good until you wear through them. Uh, good luck with that. Next from Derek, in fact, last question this week. I've been looking at upgrading to Access as, so Access is SRAM's wireless uh, system, basically for changing gears, so it's electronic and wireless. Basically, it's magic. As I can't get my gears to shift and run consistently. After I work on them or I have the bike service, they work for a short period. My question is, once set up correctly, will Access remove the inconsistencies of cable shifting or will it require fettling like cable operated? For reference, I currently have an NX shifter and, and GX mech. My other consideration was upgrading to a better quality shifter, but I didn't know if that would be just polishing a turd. Okay, so there's a few things at, at hand here. So you're never gonna get good shifting if the bike isn't correct for it in the first place. What I mean by that is if your mech hanger is bent, it doesn't matter if you put an XTR on there, if you put an axis on there, it doesn't matter. If it's not aligned in the first place, your gears are always gonna play up. So firstly, your frame has gotta be straight, or at least the hanger has got to be straight. The next one is your chain line. If you've got a bad chain line on your bike, maybe you've got a bottom bracket axle that's too long or a chain ring that hasn't got the correct offset or a crank that's not compatible, then your gears are gonna play up because your chain, chain line is out. Okay, so you've gotta make sure that they are done. Then you've also gotta make sure that the derailleur is set up correctly in the first place. So that is your limit screws, inner and outer, and your B screw on there. Make sure that that is all done correctly. And then you've gotta make sure that there's no play in the hub. So if there's play in the hub, the cassette is gonna move around. If the cassette moves around, it's gonna move when you're changing gears. That can affect things there. And then of course, you've gotta make sure your inner and outer gears, uh, the gear cables even, are greased or oiled. Very thin grease, if you can use it. I prefer to use oil on mine. Um, just to make sure that they move and they pass without any hindrance. If that's all working, then yes, your gear should be fine. And you will always get better consistency out of gears if you're using a slightly higher end shifter. It doesn't really matter about the derailleur, if I'm honest. Uh, and I'd actually recommend people not spending crazy money on derailleurs uh, because of the fact that if you do bash it off, you're not gonna cry afterwards. Uh, but you can get much more performance from the better derailleurs, but the shifter really in cable systems is the key. Now, I've quite often said in the past, you know, you can run like a Shimano Deal or an SS derailleur. And if I was gonna do the same, I'd get an XT shifter on there. Uh, or even an XTR one that's got the bearings on there. That really does make a massive difference in terms of shifting. Don't forget, that's the thing. That's where you get the feel, the punchiness from. It's all from the shifter, but it's you setting them up in the first place. Now, when it comes to SRAM access gears, once they're set up, they work perfectly. Yeah, so you will remove the inconsistencies associated with cables, but if your bike's not correct in the first place, or your chain line, or if your hanger is bent, you're gonna get the same problems and you've just spent a load of money trying to fix a problem. So the best pull of call is make sure your bike, the hanger is completely aligned. Use a hanger alignment gauge. It's an expensive tool, not really one that people use at home, so that will require a trip to the bike shop, but it's worthwhile checking your frame is completely aligned. Because even at the eye, if you're looking at it and it looks straight and you're getting all these problems, there's a good chance it could be like a millimeter out. And that's really tricky to spot by eye. Uh, so get that checked and hopefully it'll be the end of your problems and you won't need to spend any money on actual hardware. Uh, good luck with that. And there we go, that's the end of this week's show. Uh, give us some feedback, give us a like, sub to the channel, that'd be great. Don't forget, we've got loads of new merch all the time. There's no limited edition stuff in the store. Uh, so if you want to support us there, that would be great. We love seeing everyone out on the trails wearing our stuff and we'll see you soon. ta -ra.